please turn to our passage, which you'll find on page 987 of the Church Bibles, Mark chapter 15, beginning at verse 21. We've reached the climax of Mark's gospel account. This is what the preceding chapters have been leading up to. There have been constant intimations that Jesus is to die, and that his death is the focus of his life and ministry. Yet there's a, an irony for the preacher. The events of this passage are so significant, but it's difficult to know what to say about them. Mark's telling is taught, epitomized by the sentence that begins verse 24, and they crucified him. Somehow, you don't want to add to what Mark wrote. It feels it is enough. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Tom Wright, also known as N.T. Wright, was my bishop when I was a curate in Durham Diocese. I remember moaning to him about the church where I was on the staff. I, I don't recall it ever being explained why Jesus died. What? Not even on Good Friday, he asked. But Good Friday in spite of, in some ways, being the obvious time to explain this, just doesn't feel right as a time of explanations. Somehow, you just want to sit with the events. Today is our Good Friday come early. I can see why some might prefer to preach on Jesus' triumphal entry and then skip straight to the resurrection next Sunday. But our reading through Mark, which began two years ago, has been designed to culminate with the crucifixion this Sunday, followed by the resurrection on Easter Day. There'll be opportunity for you to dwell individually during Friday's Matthew Passion service. But for now, I want to draw out some aspects of Mark's account. Richard Dawkins is sometimes referred to as the High Priest of Atheism. But I was struck by an occasion when he was introduced using some such words. In response, he said that he'd never claimed to be an atheist, rather an agnostic. This uh, clearly threw his introducer, so uh, Dawkins went on to explain that he was only 90% certain there wasn't a god came as a revelation to me. Would I want to be in the shoes of someone who's only 90% certain about something so important? What about the other 10%? What if it was true? At his crucifixion, Jesus appeared to be surrounded by people who were only 90% certain 
about what they were doing. The chief priests and teachers of the law who had orchestrated his death say, in verse 32, let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And verse 36, a man who offers Jesus wine vinegar to drink says, let us see now if Elijah comes to take him down. They remind me of a university friend with whom I had conversations about Christianity. He, likewise, wanted a sign, some sort of writing in the sky. But I am reminded of what Jesus said in Luke 16. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Jesus could have come down from the cross, but he chose not to. His attitude was all along that expressed to his father at Gethsemane, not what I will, but what you will. Had Elijah intervened, it would have been to say, I know that you can come down of your own accord, but you mustn't, for my sake and that of others. If you do, then we are lost. Sometimes we dwell on Jesus' physical suffering, which was real enough. He even chose not to take the myrrh offered to him as a sedative. Verse 23. But the real depth of his suffering is expressed in his words in verse 34, known as the cry of dereliction. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? This was an expression of what it cost for Jesus to take away my sin. At that moment, he was separated from God the Father. To feel abandoned by God would be devastating for any of us. But for Jesus, given the intimate nature of his relationship with his father, it must have been more so. That cry was an expression of what it meant for him to carry the burden of God's wrath in our place. Our forgiveness came at such a price. Verse 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. John tells us that the cry consisted of Jesus saying, it is finished. In one sense, an expression that his life was over, his pain and suffering ended. But also, having the sense of, it is accomplished, that which he came to do. Through his death, Jesus accomplished our salvation, paying the price for our sin. It is accomplished. As an expression of this, at that moment, verse 38, the curtain of the temple was torn in two 
from top to bottom. The curtain had separated the Holy of Holies, the place where God dwelt. No one was able to have access apart from the high priest once a year. And then only through the shedding of sacrificial blood. Now, through Jesus' death, we have direct access to God, accorded by Jesus' sacrificial death once for all. I shy away from entering into an explanation of penal substitutionary atonement, which I believe, but at a moment such as this, somehow it just doesn't feel right to do so. It's like being present at a deathbed or a gravesite. Just being there is enough and you don't want too many words. But I will share Stuart Townend's poetry about this moment from his song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders, ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I've mentioned the chief priests and teachers of the law and the man who offered Jesus wine vinegar. But there were others present whose attitude was different. Among them, Simon of Cyrene. It's significant that Mark mentions that Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. From this, we may deduce that they were known to Mark and to those for whom he was initially writing. Perhaps Simon was already a follower of Jesus, or perhaps through this encounter, he became one. And the centurion, verse 39, most likely in charge of overseeing the execution. We're told that when he heard Jesus cry and saw how he died, he broke with his code of professional conduct to say, surely this man was the Son of God. He didn't keep with what those around him were saying about Jesus, but rather expressed what he believed based on what he had experienced. I wonder where you find yourself. Perhaps you are a follower of Jesus, having already accepted the salvation he offers through belief that he died for your sins. You believe that by his wounds we are healed. If so, may this recounting of Jesus' death be a reassurance of sins forgiven and salvation assured. Perhaps this is an opportunity to thank Jesus for what he has done for you through his willingness to die on the cross on your behalf. But perhaps you find yourself at the foot of the cross for the first time. Maybe someone new to church, 
or you may have been coming for a long time. But it's now. But it strikes home to you what Jesus' death means for you personally. The fact that although he could have come down from the cross, he chose not to do so. And he made that decision in obedience to his Father's will on your behalf. If you find yourself in that situation, now is the time to say to God that you're sorry for your sin that caused Jesus to die, but also that you're grateful and willing to accept his free gift of salvation through believing that Jesus is the Son of God and that his death has paid the price in full of your sin. Let us pray. Lord, we stand before the cross with a broken spirit. Through the cross, speak to our hearts that word of pardon and acceptance so that we may be gripped by your love in Jesus Christ and brimful of thanksgiving. May we now go out into the world to live our lives in his service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.